Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show with your hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Phil and Ted's guest today is actress, comedian, author, survivor, and hero, Allison Arngrim. And now, your Sexy Boomer hosts, Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet. Welcome to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. I'm Ted Bonnet. And I'm Phil Proctor. We have a very special guest for you today, Nasty Nelly from Little House on the Prairie. And now... She's all grown up and got some great stories to tell us. Allison Arngrim. Hi, Allison. Hi. <laughs> and, and of course, uh, Allison uh, was a, a star on The Little Horse on the Prairie about a family <laughs> that raised dwarf horses. I used to watch it religiously. I just loved it. And how did you were you were younger than you were like 12 years old. So I guess you could ride those little horses without, you know, any difficulty. The, the only horse I could ride would have to be a tiny midget um, special horse because I am like the worst. Seven years on a Western can't ride a horse. Actually, Allison uh, was a star on Little House on the Prairie. Uh, and she was little and she could fit into the house. So. <laughs> About, yeah. so, so listen, where were you raised, Allison, so to speak? By wolves. I was, um, I was raised in L.A. and I was a little girl living at the Chateau Marmont on Sunset Boulevard. Oh, my goodness. Three, four, five years old, living in the Chateau Marmont. Um, and the actress, Beatrice Lilly, B. Yep. Lilly. Oh, B. Lilly, sure. Old, music hall, before above, British. And she was in Thoroughly Modern Millie with Julie Andrews and Mary Tyler Moore and um, Carol Channing. Carol Channing. Uh, Green Glass. Great Carol Channing. Carol Channing with the bolos. So this crazy movie, um, B. Lilly was... The old lady who was chloroforming the girls and throwing them in a basket and selling them into white slavery. Yeah, I read for that part, but I was charming <laughs> family film. So, <laughs> and she lived up, like up, up, upstairs down the hall. I found her in the hall. She was a very old lady, and she was very crazy and dotty, and she would wander the halls of the Chateau Marmont. And I was like four, and I found her in the hall and brought her home. And I was like, "This person followed me home. Can I keep her?" Um, <laughs> and she became my friend, and she came to all my parties. So I was friends with B. Lily. It was wonderfully wackadoo Eloise at the Plaza kind of life. Was the Chateau Marmont crazy then? Yes. I think it was crazy from the get-go. I think, like, back in the 20s, it was nuts. But when we were there, yeah, let's see. Who was there when we were there? Um, Paul Newman was staying there sometimes in from New York. Uh, Sidney Poche was living there. Uh, Bea Lilly was living there. All sorts of famous people were there. And th people were starting to do stuff. The riot when they flipped over the bus on Sunset Boulevard that uh the whole hey what what's that sound everybody look what's going to that that right that particular specific right that was in front of the chateau and they said uh they they finally had to like lock up the windows because um people were kind of hippies would come in through the kitchen windows for food and stuff they, they, there wasn't a restaurant bar on the lawn there was just a lawn uh <laughs> you could get a drink in the lobby but that was like it and um yes it was very nutty um what was I said in my book? It, it's known now as the home of crazed, drunken, pants-dropping celebrities. But it was always the home of crazed, drunken, <laughs> pants-dropping celebrities. Yeah. Um, it was always a Hollywood hangout. Yeah, Sharon Tate and Roman Polanski uh, lived there and, like, moved from there to the, the hills. The Cielo House, yeah, which is about 10 minutes away from where I live right now. So it was all very, 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 very Hollywood. And then we, we moved to the Hollywood Hills, of course. We lived in Hollywood, and then we went to Hollywood Hills. And then we lived around the corner from Liberace. Yeah. Because my father was working for it. My father was at Seymour Heller & Associates, the huge management firm that had Debbie Reynolds, Liberace, and he was working for Seymour. Seymour Heller was Colonel Tom Parker to Liberace's Elvis. <laughs> this right-hand man, right to the grave. So my father was working for Seymour, and he said, okay, I'm going to take care of Liberace in um, Vegas. You'll take care of him in, like, in L.A., so you need to get a house, go rent a house in the Hollywood Hills and, like, near Liberace. To, you know, in case something comes up, he's had an interview with the house, you need to go over. So sure enough, <laughs> living around the corner from Liberace, Halloween, you had to, of course, at trick-or-treating, go to Liberace's house. He would be out of town, but he would have the, the butler come with the silver tray with the darling little plastic pumpkins full of jelly beans. It's very nice. <laughs> Michael Jackson. I knew him, too. I mean, we went to Gardner Elementary School. My goodness. They came out from what, Indiana, and then they were in the Hollywood Hills. And they were going to, he and the rest of Gardner Elementary School, where everybody in the world who is famous went. And 
I would see him. There's like a grade ahead of me. And I was not starstruck. They had just broken. They're just getting famous. I didn't care. And other girls said, it's Michael Jackson. Could you get his autograph for me? And so I would go get his <laughs> autograph for other people. And like a schmuck, I didn't get one for myself. And but we would pass their house. Those of us who took the bus, we passed the Jackson house. And they were the subject of great gossip yeah. because everyone knew that their father was abusive and mean and terrible. And everyone said, yeah, I heard that they're like, they're going to have to get permission to get married when they get older. He said no one can date. They can't. The ones who are older teenagers can't date till they're 18. They can't get married till they're 25. Their father is going to tell them who mm -hmm. they can marry. We're like, what? 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 what is the 1960s? What are you talking about? Who does that? And that we were hearing all these weird stories and gossip. But the gossip always centered around that the father was terribly controlling and unpleasant. Hmm. And this was kids. This is the neighborhood was already talking like this. You really were a child of Hollywood in every sense of the word. I thought everyone was on TV. Like until I was like hmm. seven, I thought it was like people took turns. It was like a lottery, like everyone was on television. Oh, yeah. It, listen, John Ritter, uh, who is a dear friend, and we lost him much, much too early. Uh, he, he told me that when he was a kid, he thought his dad, Tex Ritter, killed people for a living. <laughs> he did. He would, you know, leave for the studio in his cowboy outfit. And then, and then right? <laughs> and when John saw him on television, he was shooting at people and killing people. <laughs> so until he grew up, he, he, he was in fear of his father and, and his six guns, you know. We would see friends of ours drop dead on some cop show. Yeah. And then they'd show up at dinner a few days later. And go, yeah. like, hey, I guess they're not dead. Um, and then my mother, I, I had to figure out TV wasn't right because my mother was um, cartoons. My mother was the voice of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Oh. She was the voice of Gumby. She was sweet Polly purebred underdog's girlfriend. Oh. Where, oh, where is my underdog gone? And she was Davy of Davy and Goliath. Wow. Or as she always put it, come on, Goliath, let's go outside and pray. Um, <laughs> she thought that was pretty sappy. She was like, oh, my God. She would come home in such a good mood. Oh, I was taping underdog all day. And then she'd come home and go, oh, God, I was doing Davy and Goliath. I need a drink. Uh <laughs> <laughs> How did you get your first break? You were all around these show business people. Your dad was in management. Uh, you know, and, and so many times, you know, people in show business don't want their kids to go into show business. It sounds like you you had a family that loved what they were doing and were happy to introduce you to it. And and didn't seem to know any different, like <laughs> like itinerant show folk. Yeah. You know, I had the, the older brother who was yep. on TV. So literally everyone was working. I had an agent. I had Batman's agent. I was with Lou Sherrill, huh. who was Adam West's agent. So as a child, I had Batman's agent. Top that. Wow. Um, <laughs> my first big thing was the Hunt's ketchup commercial. And that was where I was trying to get the tomato in the bottle and it doesn't go and it splatters all over me. It was a big hit. That's when I started swearing because <laughs> I'm standing there. I was like, I was adorable little child, my white tennis outfit now covered in tomato juice. And this poor woman's just like, oh, honey, can I get you anything? I said, yes, please get this goddamn tomato juice off of me. <laughs> <laughs> How old were you? I was six. It's like Betty Davis at six. Uh, <laughs> uh, get this goddamn tomato juice. So um, I started working and I, I did an episode of this and an episode of that. And then, of course, I went on this audition for Little House on the Prairie. So I had read for the part of Laura and Mary, which is insane because, like, to be so wrong. And then they went and made the pilot with, of course, Melissa Gilbert and Melissa Sue Anderson, who should play Mary and Laura, not me. And so I went on with, but oh, they did it. They made the thing. I saw the pilot. Oh, there you go. And so, like, then I get a call to come and read for Little House on the Prairie. And I'm like, no, they made that thing. It was on. It was on Christmas. <laughs> and it's like, no, it sold. Of course it sold. It's Michael Landon starring it. It's like pre sold so they're doing the series and they're doing the part where they have a town full of people. So come on in. They did not tell me that Nellie Olson was a horrible person and I hadn't read the books. I had no idea. So I get there and I just get the sides and it's like cold. I like the sides. I'm like, I have no idea what's happening. I look at the sides, I turn to my father, and went, She's she's awful. <laughs> I said, This girl is this is not normal. He goes, what do you mean? This is not a normal part. This isn't like a normal little girl. <laughs> yes. I said, she's she's a bitch. This girl is a girl. <laughs> and my father starts laughing. He says, what are you talking about? I, of course, I read it for him. So he dies laughing. He's like, oh, my God, that's the funniest thing I've ever heard. He says, don't touch it. You have, you have to just go in and read yeah. it like that. You go in, you read it exactly like that. Don't move a thing. And I'm like, okay. So I go in. It's Michael Landon and Ken McRae and Ed Friendly, the original producers. And 
I did read that, and sure, I did exactly the way. And they were in hysterics. They're, these grown men are elbowing each other in the ribs, and they're crying, they're laughing so hard. And they said, could you do it again, please? I said, oh, yes, what would you like me to change? Nothing. <laughs> that was it. And I leave, and by the time we got in the door, um, Jess, my dad's uh, business partner, was on the phone with the agent. And it was like, you're hired and your wardrobe fitting is on Tuesday. And oh, isn't that exciting? Done. Oh, my. And a lot of Hollywood were like, seriously? Because they were like, we're not doing Westerns anymore. And you know, for Michael, he's just come off Bonanza. We'll give you your show. Yeah. You know, you'll be a sexy detective. It'll be like Hawaii Five-0 kind of thing. He's like, no, I want to do Little House on the Prairie. They're just like, why do you do Little House? And of course, it was a smash. And everyone was like, Little House on the Prairie? Oh, for God's sakes. And then they were like, wait. And he's playing Charles Ingalls, who was not really an attractive man and had a large Amish kind of beard thing. And he's playing him as this sexy Malibu guy with no shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone was like, no, 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 no. This is all right. And of course, he was right. He, he was ever said, that's you can't do that. And he did. And it was a smash. Nine years that thing ran. Um, so, yeah, nobody believed it would run. Nobody. What year did the show start? 1974. How did they think that something that provincial was going to fly? The networks, everyone was like, no, this is, this, we're doing, we're doing Norman Lear. Everything is all in the family and Mary Tyler Moore and <laughs> you're out of your gourd. But Michael knew because he knew these books had been printed and reprinted and reprinted. And that this whole generation of women who had all been young women watching Bonanza young girls and were in love with little Joe also had all grown up reading little house books and wanted to, to marry Pa. Mm. And he went, genius. And there it was. And he was right. He was dead, dead right. It was a perfect market. It was a marketing absolute stroke of genius. And he did it. And of course, he, the casting was brilliant. I mean, yes, he picked me. But all the people he cast, Melissa Gilbert, the story about her is she came in, she did the reading for Laura. I mean, millions of people were reading for Laura. And Melissa was leaving the room. And Michael Lannon said, excuse me, one more thing. And yes, yes. She was tiny. She's like eight years old. He said, how tall are you? And she was totally flummoxed and didn't know what to say or how tall she was. because She's like eight, nine years old. And she thought about being measured at home. And she put up her hand and said, I'm this tall. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, my went in. Yeah, oh. that's who I want. For oh. Boom, done. I'm done. Send everyone <laughs> home. <laughs> and that was it. You mentioned that Michael Landon had a strong female following from Bonanza. As you wrote in your book, you theorized this is why he never wore underwear. <laughs> okay, 70s, right? Hello, 74. Guys were running around in tight pants and no underwear and puka shells and open shirts. And this was very Michael. But here he was, he, uh, was famous for not wearing underwear and very tight pants. And then, of course, the shirt would come up. So it was like, yeah, eight, that's not a thing in the 1800s. But by golly, um, there he was. There were over 200 episodes and has now been seen in 140 countries. Yes. Amazing. Now, you're 11 years old on this set, so you're a kid drinking all this in. And speaking of drinking... Yes. <laughs> this was kind of old-school Hollywood film production. Yep. There was drinking. They all smoked and drank. Everyone had a cigarette hanging out of their mouth and a beer in their hand. Mm. And this was, like, totally normal because it was the <laughs> 70s. These guys had come up from Bonanza through the 50s. They're like, what? So they're all smoking and drinking. And, you know, now you go on a set and... The craft services table is all health food, and they have gluten-free and, and fat-free and <laughs> macrobiotic, and nobody drinks and nobody smokes. Melissa and I were drinking coffee and eating glazed donuts at five in the morning. It's like... There was a story in your book that stuck with me, too. You were always tired because it was just exhausting, and you would find hideaway places, and you would sneak into the driver's seat of the, the prop truck to catch a nap, and you overheard Michael Landon come into the prop truck in the back where the prop guy was working in the morning, and you heard him say, hit me, and the prop guy poured some hard liquor into Michael Landon's coffee. Yes. I mean, we're talking a jug of wild turkey. <laughs> he does. He comes in and see the prop truck. Yes, they had the props, but that meant they had mm -hmm. like the food for food scenes. It means like the candy and the mercantile. And so, of course, they had all the cigarettes and the booze. <laughs> Michael said, hit me. And he said, four fingers. He said, yeah. And he got, I mean, a jug of wild turkey <laughs> and pouring this in the styrofoam cup. But it's like the usual, sir. Yes, of course. And I'm like, oh my God, what time is it even here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so that was like breakfast. <laughs> and this went all day. And then the, the crew drank beer, Coors. Ugh, why Coors? I'm like, 
Yes. Uh, but that's what they liked. And who show the aptly as in hooch of course, aptly named um, you said, you know, we're almost out of beer. And so someone's going to have to go to the store because we run out of beer. This whole thing comes to a grinding halt. <laughs> and he explained, he said, now, usually one and a half cases, two cases is normal. Now, yesterday was a three case day. <laughs> so we don't know. It could go long. Um, but usually a couple of cases, one and a half cases, but we're down to one case, which is not enough for the day. He wasn't allowed to drive anymore. Someone had to drive Husho because he lost his license so long ago. <laughs> he was driven to the set by someone who's still allowed to drive. And then at the end of the day, they would say, okay, now we've wrapped. And they would get out um, two saw horses and put the boards on, make a big table, and bring out all those jugs of booze from the prop truck and set up a bar. Oh, my goodness. And do the real drinking. <laughs> Your character uh, was a sensation. You became extremely popular, except this one time you went to a personal appearance in costume to a, uh, I think it was a private elementary school somewhere in, in L.A. What happened? It was crazy because I was the villain and who has a child villain on a series. And at that time, that was unheard of. And I mean, she was, she was kind of rotten in the books. She was very spoiled in the books. But, you know, we kind of went a little further for the show. So I was having a great time with it. And people did. They just loved it. Because Mrs. Olsen and Nellie were kind of campy, too. So people really loved them. We were the comic relief. So right away, um, people wanted us at things. But this was the first year. And they weren't sure, like, should we go in costume, not in costume? Not in costume is much better. And it was the school um, Easter fair. And somebody knew somebody, like, at the network. So they got a, you know, an in. Well, can we get Catherine McGregor and Alison Argram, Nellie and Mrs. Olsen to come? Sure. And they said, no, we want them in costume. And somebody went, okay. Now, my father said, this is a terrible idea. You're not like a Disney character. You're not, you shouldn't be going in costume. Yes, you're an actress, but you play. You don't go to events in the costume. Mm -hmm. So we get there. And sure enough, everyone hates us because we're terrifying because we're the terrible people and we're in costume. And there's this little girl. It's just like, hello, little girl. The child's like, ah. Start screaming and crying and running for her mother because it's Mrs. Olsen. She's terrified. <laughs> um, the children would have nothing to do with us and nobody would come near us for an autograph because they were just like, ah, it's those people. <laughs> they were frightened. So we're like, this is horrible. Um, <laughs> I went to go get a hot dog and a Slurpee and two little girls came running up behind me and kicked me in the butt oh. and knocked face down on the pavement. And with the petticoats and everything, I was like a turtle. I could not get up <laughs> and um, lost my hot dog and my Slurpee. I'm so upset. <laughs> and my father comes like, this is a bad idea. Picks me up off the pavement. Gets me another Slurpee and a hot dog, mind you. And we left. And he he called them and he said, he said you know, she was attacked. He was very dramatic about it. But he said, look, he said, it incites people. <laughs> you can't go out in that car. It, it will incite people. And then I did a parade. Uh, Santa Claus Lane Parade in Hollywood. And one year, I'm going down the street in the parade and you're waving away. And someone threw a McDonald's cup of orange soda at my head. Oh. And I was moving. So I'm very impressed. They hit a moving target right in the face. Oh. And um, and both times, I remember being like initially freaked out and then going, wow, man. And having this sort of like out-of-body experience where I go, so what did I do as an actress, what did I do that caused someone to, to, to get this reaction, right? Yeah, I mean, somebody had to just leave reality. Someone had to see me and flip out and turn off their brain, not go, well, it's the actress, it's the person from the TV who pretended. They had to go, ah, this is real, and wig out and attack me. Wow. How old were you when that happened? I was 12 when I got kicked in the butt and knocked to the pavement, and I'm um, 16 when I got hit in the face with a cup of soda. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Phil and Ted, Sexy Boomer Show, and we'll be back after this blast from the past. Now that it's been proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that our shadow government, the CIA, has been surreptitiously experimenting with mind-bending drugs on the military and the unsuspecting public, here is CIA spokesperson Shrubby Speedwell in the studio with us to categorically deny everything. That's my job. Well, it doesn't take a lot of brains to come here and deny things that people know are true. That's right. I don't have any brains. I was one of the first ones we experimented on. With your knowledge? Oh, no. I just had a job in Chicago at the time as a business machine. You know, I worked in one of those big buildings and looked pretty much like I do now, except I had brains then. Well, what did the CIA do? Did they dope your coffee? They doped everything. The CIA used to come through the office every day disguised as a snack cart. You'd eat one of those double-glazed donuts, and you were. 
Both of you. You mean it, it turned you into a schizophrenic? Not me, only him. Who are you talking to? I'm sorry, we can't tell you. That information is still classified. No, it isn't. Sure it is. What? It is not. We oh, removed the classification <laughs> and we sold the story to the Reader's Digest. No, uh, we didn't. Yes, we all did. Right, we'll you can be look back it up in the to classified talk to both of yourself. our guests hey, that's no way to talk after to this. You're listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. If you want to be notified when a new episode posts, subscribe to our podcast right now by clicking the subscribe button in your podcast player. And if you'd like to toss something in the tip jar to help our habit, look for the donate button on our website, sexyboomershow.com. Back to Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet and their special guest, actress and comedian, Allison Arngrove. Welcome back to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show. We'd like to thank our very generous cash donors to the show, our listeners, Edgar Bullington, James Mack, J.L. Milligan, Leslie Orford, John Lagawa, Lawrence Budd, Charlie Moed, and someone who has volunteered to offer a recurring $5 a month payment, Patricia Poet. Thank you so much for your generosity. You're all officially now members of the donor party. And you know, we have a very sexy guest with us today, the beautiful Alison Arngrim, who's probably best known as the writer of Confessions of a Prairie Bitch, stories about her childhood experiences as an actor in The Little House on the Prairie. Allison, you had an accelerated childhood. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> Sounds you. like it. When you were 15 and 16, you were hanging out in punk rock clubs. Yeah. You, you, you're working Little House of the Prairie, and then you're going to some punk club that night, underage. I would paint my nails black or purple glitter and stuff like that, but I was very conscientious. I took every scrap of nail polish off my fingers before Monday morning. Um, I wanted to dye my hair green, and I did not dye my hair green because <laughs> I, I did not screw everything up for the show. But it was interesting because the whole punk sort of sensibility sort of worked. I was listening to this music. And like in the mornings on the way in and then playing this character that was rebelling against everything and telling everyone to go to hell. Um, so it kind of kind of lent itself to the whole nice parallel. Yeah. yeah, it worked for me, but it was great. Yeah, I, I you know, I couldn't not, not on a school night or work night, but on the weekend <laughs> I saw um, Dead Boys, Wall of Voodoo, uh, Devo. You would think that somebody in your shoes at that age, having the success, the fame, the access to wild punk clubs and living the life at age 15, 16 might go off the rails a bit with, say, substance abuse, which was very popular at the time. What happened to you? Well, I tried, <laughs> <laughs> but I wasn't very good at it. The 1980s, me and Jay Leno, the only two humans not on cocaine for an entire decade. <laughs> I didn't. I did, you know, I did usually, you know, smoking pot things, but Every time I like tried drugs and there were certainly lots and lots of them around in my own household, as well as all bunks, everyone I knew, I was like, I didn't think that was very good. <laughs> I don't think I'm doing that again. I feel awful. You were lucky that way that it just it didn't appeal to you it, and the cocaine didn't affect you like other people. Yes. I started it once and went, you pay money for this. Yeah. Could not get into it. What's even more remarkable about the fact that you didn't go off the rails that way was because you did not come from a stable household. Lord, no. See, I, I went off the rails. I, we had a panel discussion with the cast of Little House for this Wizard World online virtual um, autograph show we just did. And that was one of the things they were talking about, becoming an actor and having your life turned upside down. And Melissa said, yeah, you're a child actor, your life is turned upside down, and you're famous. And I said, well, my life was already upside down, and getting on Little House on the Prairie turned my life right side up. Hmm. Everything was already nuts. I was already been abused, exposed to drugs, and every insane possible thing that could happen. It already happened. Your older brother was having a party at your house. Yeah. They had a cake there, and of course you were a little kid, right? I mean, how old were you? About eight, and I usually did all the baking in the house, and that's why I was so surprised that somebody had made a cake and not consulted me. So you see this cake at the party, and you go, ooh, you're eight years old, icing. And so you started eating the icing. Oh, worse. I was in the kitchen. They just finished it. And I found the bowl of icing. And, you know, you're talking about eating the bowl of icing, like and the beaters where like everything. And that's when my brother and his friend walked into the room and both went white as a sheet and seemed really upset that I was eating the icing. <laughs> I was like, what? What's going on? And that's when they explained that they were having a party and they would put um, LSD in the cake icing. 
and that um, they'd worked it out. I guess they thought they'd worked it out that like so much LSD so that like each slice would be sufficient, <laughs> which meant that um, having eaten the bowl of icing and they said I basically dropped enough acid to like take out half of West Hollywood. Good God, what happened? I was surprised more did not happen. I mean, they said, well, you're coming to the party now because what are we going to do with you? So I went to the party and that was like, then I was like, can I have champagne? <laughs> And the other people, part. she can't have champagne. It's like, well, she's had more drugs than the rest of you. So give her the champagne. So yeah, so I had champagne and more cake. And I did not get as nuts as I thought I would. And and everyone was sort of fawning all over me. Everyone was waiting for me to freak out. So if I said, let's play Monopoly, they're like, for God's sakes, get the Monopoly set. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, really weird. Um, I don't know how many of my brain cells I may have fried during that, but I, I got through the night. But that was, yeah, the kind of chaos that was like a regular occurrence when I was under the roof of your home growing up. I mean, eight year old having uh, washing down LSD infused cake icing with champagne. I know that was at a party later, but still. Right. And so that's the thing. I kind of was jaded and blase by the time I was 14, 15 years old. Wow. I'd probably tried everything. <laughs> so it mm -hmm. was like, yeah, whatever, man. So by the time my friends were starting to do crazy things and try drugs <laughs> and do all this stuff, I was like, yeah, you probably won't like it. I've done it. <laughs> like, okay, Been there, wrong. done that. I've done that already. And so I was sort of over it. And then I kind of also had a similar thing that um, as Jay Leno had, because Jay Leno, you know, did, did totally non-drugs, didn't drink or do anything. And which I remember his, his manager knew my dad at one point. Said, yeah, I call him when he's on the road. He's in his room by himself. Who the hell does that? Um, and so he didn't. And he said at one point, mm. he said, well, I can either do this or I can go party. I can go party all night and with everybody else and drink and do drugs and blah, blah, blah. Or I can do this and I want to do this. I want to write jokes and I want to tell jokes. I want to work. And he was so obsessed with the work, he didn't really want to go party. And I have that sort of streak. Mm. I was more interested in doing things and like work than just blowing my brains out on drugs, which most of my friends were way into. I hung a right instead of a left when a lot of people didn't do that. But also fascinating because... You had every reason to go off the deep end with drugs because of the darker side of your story about sexual abuse in your home that you were a victim of from your older brother. Uh, as I said to Larry King, you know, I was sexually abused as a child. I'm an ex-child star. I am way behind on that tri-state killing spree I should be on by now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's right. just kind of true. Um, I've had a lot of therapy <laughs> at this point. I got into therapy in my 20s. I've now had like 24 years or something of therapy, not counting group and et cetera. Um, so, I, I mean, I did wind up, yeah, I had to go to the shrinks and sort of have pieces put back together in my brain. But, hmm. yeah, a, a lot of people, when they have that kind of trauma, and, and if you talk, now they kind of are on to it. Now when someone shows up with a serious drug addiction and problems, the first thing they ask them is, did you experience any particular trauma mm -hmm. as a child? Do you have PTSD? Mm -hmm. Were you abused? And it's like, yes, like 99% of the time. So they kind of got on to that. Um, yes, people with that kind of trauma... And and I, I absolutely did have PTSD for years. Um, I think I still technically do. I have like weird hearing. Hmm. What did you say? And, what? <laughs> I can hear a bat fart at like fifty paces. <laughs> it's it, it's just weird. It's like what was that? I like flinch. So I had the PTSD thing, but a lot of people do. They would they self medicate. They go nuts. They have really yeah. serious problems, and that's just like a thing I didn't do. Hmm. What was the span of your age when you were victimized? Gosh, I guess I started at uh, six. And then I know it was around nine when I finally said, um, you're not doing this anymore. I'll call the cops. Wow. To be dealing with that kind of abuse, being a villain on a very popular TV show, having pretty wild upbringing all anyway, how did you keep your rudder in the water? It's been said that if, if you have one, one person, a person, who's a positive influence in your life. Even It's like for even a brief period of time. There are people who've had horrible, horrible childhoods, way worse than mine, but they literally, a person said, you know, you're actually like a good person. You're going to be okay. Like once. Um, I had my Auntie Marion, mm -hmm. who took me to the set every day. Mm -hmm. 
and she used to call me her favorite niece. You know, she only had the one niece, but <laughs> it's good to know. Um, Annie Mary was amazing. I would say like Saint Auntie Mary. She was a fantastic person. She was absolutely a a moral center, if you will, and a good person. Um, I had the cast and crew of Little House on the Prairie, who despite <laughs> all the beer and cigarettes, mm, family. were really, really nice to us kids and very supportive. It was a very, very supportive, safe environment. I felt that everyone was very nice to me and supportive of me. I didn't feel like anybody was being awful to me. Um, and as an adult, yes, I absolutely could have told them. As a kid, you're like, no, I can't possibly tell anybody this. And you didn't tell anybody? Not a soul. How long did you hold on to this secret? It was like in my 20s. My God. And it's, it's, it's stupid, but people do it. The, you're told, Do you must never tell anyone this. And it's complete BS. But it works on a child. Because you're a child. Right. And you don't know any better. And so you don't tell anybody. Do you think it was fueling any of the rage of your character? I mean, was it cathartic? Yes. I, that's, that's one of the other things that was helpful. Okay, so I had, I had people around who were really cool, who I could look up to and go, well, they seem to be doing all right. Um, I read a lot. So I was like reading about, reading about psychology, reading about things, reading about people who had undergone terrible things and survived and gone on. I, I loved reading about like Holocaust survivors and stuff. people who'd had terrible things happen and done very well. So, okay. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, I had this character I played where I went to work and I yelled and screamed and threw things and broke things. Who does that? <laughs> I, I, people go to work and they go, yeah, it was really hard. I had to be nice to everybody all day. I had to go to work and be terrible to people all day. I could let it out. It's like if you go to work and, oh, I'm in a bad mood. Well, I got to kind of put on a nice face. I could go to work and go, yes, I'm in a bad mood. And it's like action and scream and be miserable and stomp my feet. And the energy you let out doing, I would, yeah. people would ask my mother, they go, what's she like at home? She goes, it's all out of her system. She, comes home and takes mm. a nap. Uh, it was, so you were doing your mm. primal screaming. It was. I was letting all this out. It was so much fun. And I did feel better at the end of the day. I thought, well, that's a pretty good boy. I can really talk about a place to dump my unbridled rage. That's kind of good. Wow. And it felt really good. So I had that going. And I had a job. But that's the other thing, too. Yeah. All teenagers yeah. should get a job. The job gave you a sense of self-worth. And responsibility. How far can you go? Okay, so it's the weekend, and maybe you're high, and maybe you're drinking, and maybe you're going to see punk bands, but you know, on Sunday, you're going to take off all the nail polish, and you're going to go to bed early. And you're going to get up, because you have to be at work at 5 o'clock in the morning. I know there's people that don't care. I mean, we've seen how many actors and performers and people who don't show up at the movie set or the TV set or the recording studio because they're hammered, but not on Little House. That was... A, there you go. These guys were all drinking and smoking and doing stupid things. And they, by God, they were all there at five in the morning and they worked all day. And so you couldn't really call Little House and say, I had too much to drink. They'd say, so, so did we. That's no excuse. <laughs> <laughs> we're all high now. What are you talking about? Get over But in credit to your character, you drew the line and stopped the abuse uh, yourself uh, once you realized it was wrong. And this was before you started Little House on the Prairie. Yes, yes. So, so you had already come to grips with that. I had moments where I could be a fairly ballsy little kid. Maybe it was, like I said, like the, the, the Hunt's Ketchup commercial, please get this goddamn tomato juice off of me. <laughs> there, I did have a streak that at some point would go, okay, yeah, that's enough. Yeah. Another thing that's very useful for people who've been through horrible trauma is looking back and going, okay, I did this thing. Okay, oh, oh, I did that. I got through that. Oh, I survived that over there. Oh, there was the time I was really tough and I was able to, to be able to catalog it, look back and go, well, wait, I did do it. I've done it before. I can do it again. Yeah. Mm. And, and that's why, like, writing your life story. Now, not even just like, well, yes, the autobiography, obviously helpful, but because um, I do my show, my stand-up show, and they're real stories from my life. And then I started going to France and with this guy, Patrick, doing a French version of my stand-up show. So I was at a conference, a child abuse conference, because of the National Association to Protect Children that I'm on the board of. And I met all these, like, doctors and neurologists, people like brain surgeons and psychiatrists. And they said, okay, let me see if I got this right. So you wrote your life story. Yeah. But you get up in front of people and recite Basically, like like your life story. Yes. And then you go and do it in another language. 
<laughs> yeah. C'est impossible. <laughs> and they went, do you have any idea what you're doing to your brain? And I said, no, no. And they said, okay, so neural pathways. Yeah. Um, one doctor explained he worked at a hospital dealing with a lot of people who had methamphetamine problems. And some of them were really bad off. And he said, one of the first things we do is we get people to write out their life story. And he says, and frankly, it could be like in crayon on the back of an envelope. We really don't care. But some people's lives have been so chaotic, they've never even sat down and stopped and said, okay, this happened, then this happened, then this happened. There's just been no point to even time to reflect. Mm. So we say, okay, well, how'd that happen? And I mean, <laughs> literally, there were people who were like, you know, maybe when I robbed the bank, that's when things started going wrong. And they, they didn't, you know, who thought about it? They didn't have time to think about it. And that when people put stuff in order, they went, wow, that's really interesting. I did this, and then this happened, and this happened, and then I did that. Oh! And it seems simplistic, but people who've never done that really have a great reaction when they start doing it. And he said, and then when you discuss it, we have them write it out, and then we have them, like, read it. So when then mm. when you tell someone, it ha does things to your brain. And then they said, and learning another language does things to your brain. And trying to talk about what happened to you in another language, they said, you're like, you know, tearing neural pathways in your head. <laughs> it's not like a pen knife. It's like, oh, my God. You, like, stick something in your ear and jiggle. They said, that's really unusual. They said, have you noticed that you feel any better <laughs> since you started to? I'm like, yeah, come to think of it. Um, so that does work. Talking about what happened to you and putting in writing and talking about it. Hmm. That is a thing when they talk about trauma and PTSD and all that. It does have to do with the neural pathways. When you're learning to tie your shoes, say, as a child, that's the biggest example, it's the easiest one. Okay, normally you learn to tie your shoes and then you don't really have to think about how to tie your shoes mm -hmm. for the rest of your life. You kind of learned it. And so it's, it's, it's ingrained and like the alphabet or very basic tasks where you learned it and now it's sort of just matter of course you you have a, a part of your brain that has recorded that how to do that and you don't think about it it's just there so it's a muscular brain thing mm -hmm. what if at the same time that your brain is learning all of these clever things you're also being abused you're being terrorized you're learning how to scream and run and freak out what if all that is being learned that's storing information and carving pathways in the same places so that's why it's very difficult for people even later in life to move forward from early trauma but if you do something crazy like <laughs> tell people your life story write your life story have a stand-up act about it and then go do it in another language <laughs> it's kind of like it's like i'm sorry we have no more disk space we just shoved everything out to make room for this <laughs> <laughs> I, I i had to like erase several gigs in there to get it all in and it actually had massively has an effect on you one of the other things that must have helped too was that you decided to do something about this and you got involved in the child abuse issue legislatively to set this up there's something called incest exception that creates exceptions for sexual abuse against children when it's between family members. Mm -hmm. This law is still on the books in many states, and you did something about it because the law was still on the books in California. You tried to overturn that law and got a deaf ear in Sacramento, even though you were known. Someone had informed you that legislators didn't care that you were sexually abused. And instead of going back with your tail between your legs, you took it on and succeeded. Could you tell that story? It's absolutely bananas. Um, yeah, so I am president of the board of directors of the National Association to Protect Children. And you can go to our website right now at protect.org and see all the incredibly weird and fabulous things that we're doing. They came to me and um, they didn't, they did not know. I been abused. It was like if somebody knew somebody knew somebody, you know, these things start. And I'd, I had done so much charity work. I had also been very active politically and socially with um, AIDS Project Los Angeles. So I had a reputation. <laughs> so I get this call and they say, we're going to be doing this thing about child abuse because so many people had done things for abused children. They tried all sorts of different things. There was law enforcement angle, the psychological angle, but they hadn't really attacked it legislatively. No one had done like a lobbying arm. And they said that was the problem. They were seeing where 
the child told, the guy got arrested, they went to court, they, they were convicted, he confessed, and then went home with the child. It's like, wait, what? Because in different states, depending where you are, um, the older version of the law was they would use an 1800s code instead of being charged with sexual molestation, rape, etc. They plead guilty to incest from an 1840s law, a crime against the marital state, which it was a law designed to keep you from marrying your like 30 year old cousin. It was not designed, had nothing to do with children. And so they pulled this out of the book because it was a misdemeanor <laughs> or a B felony at best. And they could plead out and get probation instead of being tried for rape and molestation, etc. Now, in the Western states, what happened is when they raised the penalties for sexual abuse of children in the 70s and started handing out real sentences, a whole bunch of guys and their lawyers <laughs> went to the state houses and they got an exception put in where all of these crimes, and they list all these terrible, terrible, terrible things, continuous sexual abuse, multiple victims, blah, blah, blah. And then it says, you know, 20 years, whatever, unless, this giant unless, the uh, perpetrator is a relative of the victim. And my favorite part was the words, or like a relative living in the home. Good heavens. So like house guests? What? <laughs> borders? We're accepting borders? What does this mean? Um, so some, there was a guy actually who tried it once. He said he was like a grandfather, and he thought he should not have to go to jail because he, uh, he was old and he knew them. So I'm like a grandfather. This was sort of a loophole for sex abusers to marry divorcees with children. Exactly, which is the easiest way. Like, why go to the park and, you know, have the police follow you when you can just meet a woman with children and say, oh, you need a guy in your life and, marry, and then you can get away with it. Mm. I met a defense lawyer and he said on the radio, mind you, in 25 years of being a defense lawyer for people accused of sexual abuse, I have not had a case where it wasn't the father. Hmm. Really? 25 years. He'd never had a case it wasn't the father or the stepfather. Wow. That's the guy from the defense admitting wow. it. So it's always someone known to the child. It's almost always someone known to the child. The father, the brother, the grandfather, the uncle, the, and mom's boyfriend, stepdad. That's, that's their home. They're the person with the access. After them comes the priest, the swim coach that teacher that it's mm. very rare that a complete and utter stranger steps into the picture mm, right these people who had horribly abused their own children didn't want to go to jail yeah. <laughs> and they called it the middle class white guys defense one lawyer actually told us it was referred to as that because these were upper middle class guys and they didn't want to go to jail with poor people wow and they were like what all i did was molest my kid i don't want to go to jail with bank robbers Literally, we found the 700-page transcript of the hearing when they put this law into place, and they were referring to them as captains of industry. Jeez. And I will tell you, Phil, the first words out of my mouth when I heard that were, shoes for industry. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody looked at me, what? <laughs> These guys were so important that they had good jobs, and they were their family breadwinner. Although yeah. most of my friends were abused by their stepdad, mom was working two jobs and he was home drunk on the couch, but they were sure they were the breadwinners, sure of it, and that they shouldn't go to jail. Although this has never applied to any other crime, just, just only sexual abuse of children does this come up. So it was really insane. These people had lobbied very, very hard with very, very expensive lawyers and gotten this put on the books. Hmm. It had been big in the court system because a defense attorney could say, I'm not even going to mount a defense. You're going to plead guilty, but it's okay. You'll do no jail time because you're related to the victim. So, And you can get deferred entry of judgment and have your record expunged and you'll never be a sex offender. It's great. And prosecutors could say, I have a 100% conviction rate. Nobody went to jail, but they have a 100% conviction rate because everybody pled guilty knowing they wouldn't go to jail. <laughs> and one of the things we saw in California was that the senators who really liked it were friends with this one therapist. And magically, when all of the defendants got deferred to therapy, they only got sent to this one guy. And it was came to about two and a half million a year, I believe he made. Wow. Yeah. So it was kind of follow the money thing. And there are states where people have a racket set up where they're profiting enormously. Hmm. If you weren't particularly concerned about the ethics of it, it was a very handy law for a lot of these people. 
So we found a very nice senator in California, guy, Senator Batten, a, a Republican, yes, of all things. Mm. He, he was out in the desert, as he said, I don't get the big, exciting, make the news stuff. Mm-hmm. I'll happily introduce this legislation. <laughs> this will be exciting. And he said, also, mm. I, my degree, my background is actually in psychology, and I know all about these guys, and they're such liars, and I'm so tired of them. So, yes, I'll be happy to help you. Perfect. Which was great. What year was this? This was 2004. Before I got there, they changed the law in North Carolina, Arkansas, and they just changed it in Illinois. And then we did California. Arkansas, oddly, was sort of happy to do it. They said, we're, we're tired of being the focus of jokes about that. So, mm. But California really wanted to keep it, mm. which is kind of mind-blowing. Yeah. There was a psychiatrist and a lawyer and a doctor and a, a, a me and all these people. And we presented all this fabulous stuff to this whole public safety committee. And they said, no. I mean, some of the senators who were on that committee had been there when they put the exception in place. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, we had the wrong audience. They were just looking at us like, please die. How do they defend their position? They didn't care. They didn't defend their position. They were like, because we can't. They had passed all of these laws without anyone paying any attention whatsoever. This is long before there was a Megan's Law or any kind of the stuff we hear about now. No one was paying attention to this. And so they felt quite entitled to do whatever the heck they wanted without anyone calling them on it. And they were not accustomed to getting called on it. And they were so rude about it. They were really mean about it. And as I said in the book, a uh, senatorial aide actually said to me, no one in Sacramento gives a shit that you were molested. I quote unquote. Mm. I was like, Mm. really? Well, being straight up about it. Thank you. So she was actually very helpful because she <laughs> laid it out for us. And some of the people we went up with who went through this and when we got shot down were really traumatized by this. A lot of people were crying. A lot of people were really upset. I got mad and called my publicist. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's like, <laughs> did some people go home? I called my publicist. <laughs> so he called the producers at Larry King Live and said, well, here's what's going. They were like, what? And no one else would cover it. There were newspapers we talked to and they said, no, no, um, we're, we're uh, too involved with a couple of the senators, so we, we're not going to say anything negative. I mean, it was really crazy. This is like the Catholic Church. Yeah. The victims are being victimized a second time. The L.A. Ta- L.A. even. I remember I met the woman who broke one of the articles about the Catholic Church. She said, two years, two years I was writing articles and they would not run one of them. Wow. So people don't want to talk about this stuff. They were really trying to shut it down back in the day. Hmm. But you had a plan. I got on Larry King and I said, I'll talk about whatever you want. I'll talk about being abused. I will talk about Little House in the Break, but I will only do it if you let me talk about the law. And they said, no, that's a great idea. Yes, yes, of course. And I did. We were like naming names and putting stuff. And uh, Larry King was like saying, everyone go to www.protect.org. And they did. And of course, Protect was ready. We put up the pictures of the senators and their phone number and their fax number and email. And said, this is who you call. This is who said no. Wow. And we blew it out. We, we crashed the servers in Sacramento. It was huge. Everyone tuned into Larry King to see Nellie Olson from Little House in the Prairie talk about being abused. Mm. People went nuts. And so luckily, our Senator Batten said, yeah, I'll, I'll write another one. I can do it again. I don't care. Uh, so we reintroduced it. And this time we got so much support because everyone heard about it. And they had tried different excuses. They said, oh, well, the judges won't like it. And so next thing you know, we had the judges like group sign a letter, go, yeah, we love it. And they said, the prosecutors will never stand for this. And the prosecutors called us and went, we'd like to sign off on that. Yeah, thanks. It was an entirely different environment. And we went in and some of the older senators had gone bye bye and there were some new people. And we tore through there and went through all the committees and all the hoopla and had a lot of scary people say mean things to us and be kind of threatening and terrible. Um, that's what we called Bikers Against Child Abuse to come with us to the hearings. Oh, wow. Baca, they're lovely. A bunch of bikers. I actually rode into Sacramento at one point on the back of a motorcycle and showed up with 50 bikers. That was fun. <laughs> so, yeah, it took bikers and Larry King <laughs> and, like, hundreds and hundreds of people. And um, Arnold Schwarzenegger signed it into law in 2006. You've saved a lot of kids because these perpetrators realized they were going to go to jail for doing this. And the last thing you want to be is a guy going to jail for child sexual abuse. Right. We pulled a similar stunt in New York. That was fun. And we got that change. And that was a tough one because I think it had been on the books for like 400 years or something. We changed in a bunch of states. It is still on the books. There are still states. So this incest exception rule is still in place. Yes. Do you have an idea of how many states still allow this? 
it was like 30 and we knocked it down. So it was 20 something. Wow. But still. Yes, it's outrageous. And then, of course, statute of limitations is different in every state. And that's a whole going in circles. And whenever, ever you have a law where you're trying to change the statute of limitations to give victims longer to sue civilly or press charges criminally, immediately highly paid lobbyists and attorneys will show up in the Capitol, all from the Catholic Church. Oh, man. And they're quite open about it. So it's really scary with the, the people who would keep these laws in place. It's kind of horrifying, but it's a thing. Have you ever heard of ICAC? No. That's Internet Crimes Against Children. Every large police department in a big city has an ICAC team. It's an L.A. ICAC mm. team. Most big cities, and if they're a smaller city, they go call the big cities team, but they have an ICAC team, which are the cops who sit in a room with all these huge computer screens and aren't getting paid enough mm. to look at what they look at. These are the guys who track the trade of child pornography, child trafficking, the whole kit and caboodle. And they see the terrible things that these people send each other. Fabulously, the tech has evolved that so much of this stuff with the digital thing is so digitally coded, they can actually pull up a screen of numbers and not have to look at the picture. Yeah, I was shown a screen of numbers and I said, what's that? And I said, it's child porn. I said, I see numbers. Yes, because <laughs> we've done it now. So we can just read the, like the digital signature and not have to sift through every single one of the freaking pictures. Because it affects them. Horrifying. Mm. One of the things we did at Protect, we found out that one, they, they, weren't, they weren't getting paid enough. Budget wise, they weren't necessarily getting as much funding as they should have. They were outmanned, outgunned, etc. So we lobbied on the federal level to make sure the ICAC teams were fully funded. Then we found out that technologically, they were constantly playing catch up with these perpetrators who were very technologically savvy. So we started a thing called the Weiss Center for uh, Child Rescue Technology. We actually had people like creating and streamlining technology to give, not like patent and sell, but like give to police. And then we did a thing training people, the Hero Corps program, where veterans coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan, who were injured and couldn't go back to their old job, but really wanted something important to do, not boring, and certainly were, knew how to deal with traumatic situations, knew how to hunt, basically, that if they qualified, they could go through a training program, which we created this whole thing, Hero Program, and they would go through a whole training program with the police and forensics and all this fabulous stuff and be apprenticed out to Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, giving them more manpower and giving the veterans a new lease on life. And now we have a new thing about foster kids aging out of the foster system who have like nowhere to live and aren't going to college and have nowhere to go and are winding up homeless. We're creating a whole thing involving housing and social services for them. I don't know where you get all the time to do this. I honestly, Allison, do you still do your uh, podcast? Yes, every Tuesday. <laughs> every Tuesday at 5. Well, I had Rich Little on last week. Ah. I've had everybody from Marty Croft to Lulu Roman from Yeehaw to Michael Lerna to people from Little House in the Wall. There's just, just all sorts of fabulous people have come on and um, talk about, we call it, you know, the Allison Arngram Show, where we talk about things that make you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. How will people find that? Oh, it's on UBN Go. You go to the internet. UBN Go is a website that is a radio station, internet radio station thing. And the Allison Argrim show's on there. And they have my show's archive there. It also goes on Facebook Live on the Tuesdays at 5. And they're there. And then it rolls over and becomes a podcast on podcast finer stores near you, iTunes, Stitcher, etc. Excellent. We'll put all these links, uh, including the child abuse information, too. We'll put all that on our website. That's uh, sexyboomershow.com. I would suggest getting started with your New York Times bestseller book, Confessions of a Prairie Bitch. That Melissa Gilbert called Courage, Moxie, Hutzpah, Cajones, Allison Arngrim has them all in spades. I love this book and I love her. It has been an absolute delight talking to you because we didn't have to. Right. <laughs> you have so many wonderful, <laughs> wonderful stories, and you tell them so well. What an admirable life you've ha you have. Congratulations. You define the term survivor. Yeah, you got to do something, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, you're, you're doing it. Keep up the good work and uh, take a cat nap now and again. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Allison. Thanks. Thanks. What an amazing person she is. When you hear about all her stories and her life and her upbringing, 
She could have gone sideways ten different ways, and yet she didn't. What a testament to her character. Yeah, and it's absolutely amazing that she was able to find some time in her busy, happy life to talk with Phil and Ted on The Sexy Boomer Show. But then, who wouldn't? We have a lot of really interesting guests coming up, so stay tuned, everyone, and please remember to press that little subscribe button on your podcast player so you'll be notified whenever we drop a new show, which will be soon. And don't wear gloves while you're doing it, because otherwise it won't register. <laughs> I'm Ted Bonnet. And I'm Ted Bonnet. Oh, no, wait a minute. No. No, I'm Phil Proctor, and you're... Phil Proctor. Well, anyway, we're both sexy boomers. Bye. So... You've been listening to Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, featuring Phil Proctor and Ted Bonnet and special guest Allison Arngram. CIA Drug Practices was written and performed by Proctor and Bergman. Music by Eddie Betos and the Nervous Brothers. I'm A. Ernest Guy. Stay tuned for the next episode of Phil and Ted's Sexy Boomer Show, produced by RadioPictures.com, the makers of fine podcasts for seasoned hipsters. Man. Man.